Before we begin, I want to thank the speakers for helping us make this two-day event a success by presenting relevant topics and sharing their perspectives with the standard, defense standardization community. A special thanks to the DSPO staff and specifically uh, Ms. Nicole Dung, as well as LMI and Northrop Grumman for helping DSPO make this event a reality. To kick off this afternoon's program, we're pleased to have with us um, Ms. Stephanie Fassell, the Director of Engineering Policy and Systems, and my boss, and the Department of Defense Standardization Executive to deliver the DOD keynote. Stephanie, please. Oh. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Hear you loud and clear. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, well, I apologize for not being visible, only audible, but um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And I would like to start by saying welcome back to Michael, since he's been gone for uh, a better part of a year there. Um, it's good to have you back, and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, Mr. Saunders for stepping in and covering while you were away, but uh, we're excited to have you back and uh, covering the, the dispo for us. Um, okay, so I um, I pulled together some existing charts. The charts are not really the the important part, but they're a little bit to kind of guide where I want to take you. And and what I wanted to to talk about was kind of the the perspective that I have from where I sit in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, and and how that relates to you know where I see standards and how how important they are. Um, you know, Michael touched on that a little bit, and I know this is probably sort of a, a preaching to the choir kind of thing, because if you weren't interested in standards and didn't think that they were worthwhile and, and a good thing to have, you probably wouldn't be at this conference. But um, I really am a believer that, you know, they're, they're important for interoperability, and that is, you know, across the board important to what we do in the Department of Defense as well as, you know, outside the Department of Defense. And, and I tend to think of that in, in a broader sense of not just um, being able to communicate. Like when I first started hearing the term interoperability thrown about, it was about, you know, like radios being able to be used across services and how, how folks could talk to each other. But it's so much more than that now. And, and standards are really the, the key to making that possible. Um, reducing the total ownership cost, that was another one of the things that we highlight about, about standards. And really that, that comes from standards giving you that, that confidence that you have consistency in your products and processes because people have adhered to standards as, as they've developed and built them. And, and that's just, it's so critical. And finally, the, the sustaining readiness is, an, is another one of the things that, that um, you know, comes as a highlight of the use of standards. And we all know that that, that is where the, the bulk of our money is actually spent on our weapon systems is in, in the production and sustainment phase. We, we, you know, we commit our, our funds when we design them. And so it's important to choose the right the right standards and the right approaches when we're in the design phase to support us um, as we go go through production and sustainment. But um, that's the key is is right up front, you know, picking picking the right standards. But the other programs that go on in the Defense Standardization Program Office include things that support sustainment um, directly, like. Um, the parts management and diminishing manufacturing sources and the guide app program and and you know those are really critical too and and it's just there's there's so many things here that that don't get a lot of the spotlight but I think we should all recognize them as being you know critical and foundational to having good design and support for the weapon systems that we have out there so with that let me let me there's there's a, a whole lot of words on my title slide, so let's go on to to slide two, and um, this is just a little bit of an overview uh, for those of you that don't know much about the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. I've just got a couple of slides to kind of orient where we are, and uh, Michael touched on that 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 uh, Dispo lives with DLA, but it is also aligned to uh, research and engineering. So it's kind of an interesting thing there is 
you know, sort of why are we aligned to research and engineering? I'm going to touch on that a little bit. So the mission in, in R&E is to ensure the technological superiority for the U.S. military. And the, the, um, the head of R&E is, is actually the chief technology officer for the department. And so developing technology is the primary concern of R&E, but we also have a founda foundational engineering uh, role to play here as well. So you can see they're setting the technical direction and championing and pursuing new capabilities and concepts and prototyping. That's a lot of the stuff that we focus on and bolstering modernization by piloting new acquisition pathways, you know, sharing that um, and working it hand in hand with the acquisition sustainment group. Um, and ConOps, we work with the joint staff to develop uh, new concepts of operation that go along with the new technologies that we're developing and accelerating capabilities to the warfighter. For anybody that's, uh, you know, alive in, in the DOD universe these days, you certainly hear about speed to the fleet is the big thing. Get stuff out into the hands of the warfighter faster, faster, faster. And I really think that standards are one of those things that is, is critical to to doing that. Like people can develop prototypes and they can throw technologies out there, but if we're not really thinking about the standards as we go, we are, we're just, we're not going to be able to maintain that. It's going to be one off that we can't sustain. And, and so we got to think about that. Um, and uh, in a second, I'm going to talk to you about the modernization areas, but the bottom left corner here is what I want to show you too. This is the area that I live in. Within r and &E, I live in the advanced capabilities and engineering, and our focus is really on, um, this is our mission statement in our little subset of r and &E, which is propagating engineering best practices, solving engineering problems, and connecting the engineering community. This is what, uh, between my boss and I, we, we came up with as the things that we really spend our time working on is trying to make sure that the engineering community is connected and working problems together and sharing what they learn. And I think that that is a broad application here within the standards community as well. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more um, on another slide. But if we go into the next slide, slide three, these are the modernization priorities that, that probably many of you have seen because they're not new hot off the press. They've been they've been going on for a couple of years now, I guess. That these are the focus areas of where R and E is developing technologies. And a couple of things I want to say about the interplay of technology development and standards. So I think about it's it's important that we we think about the standards developing the standards to go with new technologies as we're developing the new technologies because, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. It's important that we think about how we're going to integrate these with existing systems, you know, as we pull new technology in, how does that work with existing um, systems that we have out there? Because it's not like we wipe the slate clean of all of our legacy systems and just <laughs> suddenly we have all brand new stuff. Everything's got to work together and we've got to have um, ways for these to work together, and standards is the way that we do that. Um, we need to be cognizant of being involved with um, developing the standards for these new technologies and the effects that these have on, on, the, on old standards. So as an example, um, uh, autonomy. There's, there's one that I, I happen to know. There's some efforts going on in that area that, it's a it's kind of a new frontier of technology in terms of not not so much the the actual technologies that enable autonomy, but also in the thinking about what does it mean in terms of like safety and testing relative to autonomy. And that's an area where we've got to do kind of some new standards to come up with how are we going to think about safety relative to autonomous systems? How are we going to think about appropriate testing? And I know you've got a section later on like additive manufacturing, which is not particularly on here, but um, you know, that's another area where there's, there are really nuances to additive manufacturing that make it different from traditional 
manufacturing processes where new standards are needed to accommodate new technologies. But then there's, there's other areas where I think, you know, this is the exciting frontier to be working on, where you're working on standards for new technologies. And, and you can say, hey, I had a hand in helping to rate standards for microelectronics or biotech, or I'm working on the new cyber thing or hypersonic, you know, materials that support hypersonic development. But I think the harder one to, to motivate ourselves to work on, but just as important, is going back to the old tried and true standards that have been around for decades that actually need a refresh because of the impact of technologies. And I will just share, I was having a conversation with my husband, who's also an engineer, and he was talking about, now I don't remember exactly what the, what the standard was, but he was telling me about some standard that has been around for, I don't know, probably 50 years or more. And the challenges that they're having on getting somebody to actually sit down and update it, because it still references like the wattage of incandescent bulbs that have to be used in the process. And I don't know if you guys are like me, it's pretty darn hard to find incandescent bulbs to put in your, in your systems these days. Pretty much everything is using uh, fluorescence or LEDs, but, and, and probably that's what everybody's actually using. So everybody that's not using an incandescent bulb is technically violating that, that uh, spec or that standard right now because it hasn't been updated for the realities of, of how technology has kind of moved on. So I think that that's important for us to think about too, is how technology even affects old standards and how they might need to be modernized um, to accommodate those. Um, I just, the next two slides, I just wanted, I put in here org charts, not because I really want to talk to you about the RE org charts, but just to give you a sense of you know, where DISPO fits within the r &E structure, this is at the highest level. Um, the, the Research and Engineering Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering includes these agencies you see here on the left side. We have DARPA and Missile Defense Agency and DIU and the Space Development Agency. And then over here on the right side in this box is the, the directors of the ddr &E. These are the areas that are essentially in, I'll, I'll call it the staff of the OUSD. So we have an area of modernization, which is principal directors that are focused on each of those modernization areas I just told you about, research and technology, which is focused on uh, labs and 6162 kind of um, S&T work, and then advanced capabilities, which is where I live, which has engineering fundamentals, and we have um, prototyping, and we have the development developmental test and, and, and evaluation organization. So um, that all lives here within r and &E. So there's a, some broad stuff. This is then uh, advanced capabilities where I just mentioned the prototyping and software, the engineering, um, I'm on slide five now, sorry. And the test resource management center. Um, it's just, it's kind of a broad stroke of things that um, we cover. I live here in this center bottom box called engineering policy and systems and, and DISPO is aligned under me. And one of the things that I, I really wanted to mention here, and I have a couple more slides that, that align with um, what I have in engineering policy and systems is I have a lot of weird different, I called it the cats and dogs job when I first applied for it, a lot of different kinds of things that fall under me. I have digital engineering and modeling and simulation and MOSA and system engineering and reliability and maintainability and human system integration and manufacturing stuff, as well as DISPO and some other things. And we've been on a um, kind of a crusade over the last year or so to focus on what our communities need in terms of what are the stumbling blocks in terms of their success what are the common challenges that are being had across the department in each of those areas? We call them pain points. You know, what are the, what are the things that are causing you pain and keeping you from being as, as successful as you could be in implementing things like, I'll say, digital engineering? And I will tell you that across the board, so I get this broad look across a lot of different kind of engineering disciplines, and there is not one of them that doesn't somewhere mention that standards in some way are a, a common need within their community, that there is a need to focus on 
um, new standards, better standards, keeping standards modernized, addressing different areas by, you know, via standards. Every single one of those communities has some kind of a standards need. And you guys probably all know that because you probably live that every day. Um, but it's just, it is so ubiquitous. And I just want to throw out there that, that if you're not already participating in developing standards, I hope it's something that, that you consider, or if you're the supervisor of people that get invited to, to help with standards or subject matter experts who ought to be participating in developing standards, that you will find a, a way to support people in, in doing that because it's important not only for your own organization and, and, and the person that's participating to get that kind of deeper understanding of what's going on across the community, but it's also your chance to influence the outcomes and to help make them be better products that help reflect the interests of your organization balanced with those of all the other organizations that are that are participating. And I would have to say, especially as it relates to um, being involved in non-governmental organizations that develop standards, I think they are often hurting for governmental participation. It's, it's often the least amount of participation they get is from, from government folks. And they would really welcome that more government participation in those standards developments and having the, the government outlook on, on given technologies and given standards development areas. So highly, highly encourage that you, um, that you take advantage of participating in those kinds of committees and things that develop standards. Um, if we go into slide six, this is just another one to, to kind of orient where we, the kinds of things that we do in the advanced capabilities. And I've touched on a lot of this, but here in, in the yellow, kind of in the middle section, this is where my group lives. And you can see that, that infrastructure standards and guidance is all mentioned in there together as kind of that foundational part of what r &E does for the whole department of providing that foundation for good design, good engineering practice, and, and making us all more effective and more efficient. If we go on to slide seven, um, this is my last one, and I just this is just a little bit of I mentioned I have all these these various uh, activities that go on in my organization, um, very much organizing around those communities of practice. And as I mentioned, every single one of those those communities that I mentioned, and the examples are here on the slide, has has got uh, a recognition that that working on standards pays off across the community. And so again, highlighting you know, encouraging participation in those when you have an opportunity to do so, to please participate in that. Um, we have a responsibility to create the engineering and test evaluation policy and guidance and standards. And, and that's not just in engineering and it's not just engineering at the high level. It also includes those kind of subspecialties that I mentioned, like uh, reliability and maintainability and some of those others we, we work down at that lower level as well. Um, advancing competencies, um, meaning what what should our workforce be competent in in order to accomplish the objectives that we have set for them? And um, I think this is one area that I want to highlight. I don't know, I've, I've now lost where it is on the agenda, whether you're going to get a highlight of that or not. But um, the, the DISPO in particular has, has put a lot of work into training activities over the last year or so. And they've got a lot of uh, good new training things that you can go to. Um, of course, most of the in-person classes are not really happening right now, but there's a lot of new continuous learning modules that are available through DAU and uh, I highly encourage you to take advantage of those. Um, very useful for learning more about things that are going on in, this, in the standards world and the things that are related to DISPO. Um, and then uh, uh, a couple of other things that I, I wanted to highlight that, that are going on. I'm just, I'm going to park on the slide for a minute because I don't have another one to show this, but uh, some of the other things that I, I think you're going to hear about some more that we have going on relative to, um, to the DISPO, we're looking at uh, trying to do some modernization and updates to the assist database. And uh, I think that that's going to be important. We are really looking at, um, for those of you that use both of these, 
Um, we're working very hard with CIO and DISA to try to find a way to, I want to go all the way and say merge, assist, and, and DISA so that for users it becomes a, a, an experience where you don't have to go to two different sources to find your, your, your specs and standards relative to IT versus relative to everything else. So I think that that's, that's one where we're, we're trying to make things better for the users by, by having those conversations about how we can pull those together. Um, we're, we're having conversations um, about how we can perhaps centralize access to the non-governmental standards, because I know there are folks out there that, that don't have that through their organizations, and how can we make sure that everybody in DOD has, has the access that they need to get their jobs done. Um, there's a lot of work going on in updating um, documentation and policies. Um, I know both the, the DMSMS and the guide up uh, documentation got updated this past year. I think one of them's getting pretty close to signature and the other one's still kind of in its review review cycle. But, um, you know, try really hard to, to keep things updated and keep them fresh live within our budget to do that of course like everybody does um so i i'm probably i've set myself a timer i think i'm approaching the end of my time um but i do if there's any questions since i can't see any questions in the chat um i, I think there's someone that might read them if there are any but i will um i'll stop there and just say i really do think that um uh, just, just like I think engineering in, in general is um, important as a foundation for what we do in the Department of Defense, I think that standards is an important part of that engineering foundation to make sure that we are uh, being as efficient and effective and, and doing the best for the taxpayers that we can and putting the best systems in the hands of our warfighters. So with that, I will um, stop and say thanks for having me and happy to take any questions that might come up. Thank you, Stephanie. I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. Uh, Dave or Chris, do you have uh, mm -hmm. questions via the Q&A? I do have one question. The question is, what have been the key challenges to establishing a model-based system engineering approach, in particular, linking intelligence data into a program's digital engineering efforts? <laughs> well, <laughs> so... I, I think, uh, you know, we are still overcoming uh, the technical challenges there. And I, I would say there's probably a couple. One of them, I think, is um, setting up the appropriate infrastructure so that those can be shared in a seamless fashion. And I think that that tends to be a stumbling block for a lot of folks is, uh, you know, having to use what we affectionately call the sneaker net to, to share models. You know, being able to set up an infrastructure where you actually can uh, have all your models together and integrated is, is important. I think there are uh, cultural aspects to that, you know, having, having everyone at all levels from the, the folks down at the, the working level to, to upper level leadership um, embracing the new paradigm of doing model-based systems engineering and, and digital engineering and understanding that means I'm not going to print you a spec for you to look at. It, it means it's all here in the model. That's how, you, that's how we're doing it now, you know, sort of getting people to understand what it really means. Uh, that's important. And I'll say there's, um, uh, within my organization, over the next year or so, we've just started kicking this off. We are looking at doing a system engineering modernization effort where we are looking at um, – the, the policies and the guidance that come out at the OSD level relative to system engineering and what do we need to do to update those to retain the, the rigor that comes from the kind of the foundations of system engineering, but uh, adapt the uh, approach to system engineering so that it can be more flexible for programs that are employing digital engineering or agile software development or some of the other um, approaches to design and development that have come along in, in the last, uh, well, you know, like decade that we haven't really updated. We still specify the, the old standard step-by-step -step system engineering process, and a lot of programs and, and projects are really struggling with um, how those step-by-step -step process don't 
don't really apply to their particular situation. And, and we want to make sure that we are we're updating our approach to system engineering to help people kind of think through what's the best way to, to flex the system engineering process to apply to whatever situation it is for, for your efforts. So, like I said, I, I think there's, there's technological challenges and there's cultural challenges that we have to overcome uh, to really get model-based system engineering fully embraced in the department. But we're getting there. We're working on it, chipping away a little at a time. Um, okay, I have one more question, um, and that is when will we expect to see changes to assist? Well, I might throw that back over to mm -hmm. uh, Michael or Tasha. Yes. <laughs> yes, Tasha, would you like to address that now or during? We do have a panel later that will address just exactly that. I'm sorry, Michael, were you talking to me? Yes. The, I, the briefly, I, can, I can give a teaser. Um, we just started the effort to federate across the DISER and ASSIST in July. So our talks are very early, but I am excited about the effort to um, determine the best way to meet the user's needs because at the end of the day, we may work on developing standards, but um, the goal is for standards to be used. And in order for them to be used, they have to be accessible. So we have been meeting li literally every other, every two weeks since July to um, address low hanging fruit. So we're in the process of identifying a few standards to link now and to identify now. And then over the next one year, we hope to actually have the metadata information that's in the DISR and assist and also to try to help DISA um, provide amplified information about what's in assist. Um, so we'll discuss um, assist modernization um, tomorrow, but until then, please hang on to those thoughts and um, hold additional questions about assist until that, that time. All right. Thank you, Tasha. And thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thanks for sharing your time and vision with us this afternoon. That was a great introduction uh, for what we have planned for the next couple of days. Well, uh, you are welcome and I, I hope you all have a, a great uh, rest of the conference. Thank you.